I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar, featuring Dr. Helen Mayberg, who's presenting on Deep Brain Stimulation and Depression, A Decade of Progress. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is dedicated to funding research around the world to identify the causes, improve treatments, and ultimately develop cures and preventative techniques for mental illness. The foundation has awarded over $300 million in research grants for more than 25 years. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Helen Mayberg. Dr. Mayberg is a professor of psychiatry, neurology, and radiology and holds the Dorothy C. Fuqua Chair in Psychiatric Neuroimaging and Therapeutics at Emory. She also serves as an active member of the Foundation's Scientific Council that identifies the most promising ideas to fund with NARSAD, NARSAD grants each year. Dr. Mayberg is a three-time NARSAD grantee in 1991, 1995, and 2002. She leads a multidisciplinary research program committed to defining the neurology of depression. In 1991, Dr. Mayberg received a NARSAD Young Investigator Grant to pioneer the use of positron emission tomography brain scanning technology to study the neurology of depression. She identified common brain networks across different depression subtypes leading the way for the development of imaging markers that can predict which treatment will be most effective based on an individual patient's biology. In 2002, Dr. Mayberg used a NARSAD Distinguished Investigator Grant to conduct pilot studies with deep brain stimulation to treat resistant depression. Dr. Mayberg will discuss the progress in this area in today's webinar. This will be an interactive event. We'll start with Dr. Mayberg's presentation, followed by a Q&A period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab of the webinar control panel. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation. As your moderator, I will present your questions to Dr. Mayberg, and we'll, we will address as many of them as possible. And now, it's my pleasure to present Dr. Helen Mayberg. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you, Jeff, and to all the viewers. Um, this is my first time doing such a webinar, and it's an interesting experience to imagine all of you watching the slides and listening to me. It's particularly a pleasure to do this under the auspice of the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, because as you heard, um, the NARSEG grants have been a pillar of my research program over my entire career, and I'm particularly grateful to their grants, to me and my group, as well as the opportunities that have been afforded hundreds and hundreds of young investigators and investigators at all levels um, doing work to understand the biology and to develop treatments for major mental illness. So I think we're all together toward a common goal, and it's my pleasure to share with you part of that journey and um, what we've been up to over the last 10 years since um, piloting work um, in deep brain stimulation of area 25 for depression. I want to start by giving a few disclosures. The work has all been supported solely by grants from foundations. We've had the benefit of the generosity of devices from companies um, that have donated devices that aren't yet available for commercial use. We are, I am going to be discussing the off-label use of devices, um, both the implants and the pulse generators that deliver the current. This work is all done under FDA guidelines. It's registered in clinicaltrials.gov but it does involve the initial work that led to a patent that has been issued and is the basis of an ongoing clinical trial. 
and in that regard, I do consult to the company St. Jude Medical Incorporated, their neuromodulation division. I think I also want, at the beginning of this presentation, to have everyone appreciate the number of people that work on a project of this type. Um, I want to particularly acknowledge my initial small team at the University of Toronto, um, led by neurosurgeon Andres Lozano, psychiatrist Tim Kennedy, and Clement Hamani, who's a neurosurgeon but a basic scientist. But as you can see, there is a large cast of collaborators now at Emory. Everyone else on the page is an active collaborator in our work. And as you can see, these, this is a multidisciplinary sort of project. It involves not only neurosurgery and neurology, but psychiatry and psychophysiology, imaging expertise across multiple modalities, electrophysiology, affective and cognitive neuroscience, we have involvement of clinical psychotherapists, biostatisticians, and importantly, um, the coordination of all of the regulatory patient management and, and clinical trials um, work. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, Dr. Gross and Dr. Holzheimer, who really spearheaded the initial studies um, underway at Emory. And I'll be referring to people throughout my presentation. So what's the context of today's talk? It, it's really sort of a back to the future, if you will, because what I want to talk about is really a pilot study, as you heard, funded um, in part by a NARSED Distinguished Investigator grant that we published on in 2005. And in all honesty, it was a very simple, small study. We really wanted to test the safety and really the utility of whether or not implanting profoundly ill, treatment-resistant, depressed patients who had failed to respond to anything might have any benefit from stimulating in an area of the brain that we've been studying, Robin Area 25, or the anatomical need, the subcolossal cingulate. And we basically, in Toronto, um, at that time, enrolled six patients. They were profoundly ill. They were severely depressed. They were all disabled, none of them working. They had been ill in the current episode on average five years, had failed every treatment known, including ECT and an evidence-based psychotherapy, in addition to every combination of medication. And we embarked on implanting in a very specific area of the brain, the subcolossal cingulate white matter and um, proceeded to see what would happen. Those first results were published, the outcome of six months of chronic stimulation at high frequency, very comparable to what had been done in Parkinson's disease in different areas of the brain, because what we found was that four out of these six patients not only got better, but three of them were in remission at the end of six months. And we were equally delighted to know that the hypothesis that had led to this experiment, namely to turn down activity in the subcolossal cingulate, this area was overactive, as I'm pointing to it in red here, prior to surgery. And with chronic stimulation, the activity actually decreased. The blood flow diminished, as we had hypothesized in the experiment. And we published this result and were encouraged and this became the odyssey of the last 10 years. So the question is, is why would we think to use deep brain stimulation for depression? What was our motivation? And I think this is a bigger picture in the field right now of major depression and psychiatry more broadly. We have treatments. The problem is they don't always work. And unfortunately, it's a very sobering fact that for the treatment of even a more straightforward major depressive episode, we don't achieve remission in over approximately 40% of patients with the first treatment that we try. Worse, we don't really have any hard and fast rules to guide us as to what treatment might be optimal. So we really resort to trial and error, and eventually and hopefully come up with a medication or psychotherapy or a combination thereof that works. And we live with the fact that relapses and recurrence are quite common. The bigger problem is the estimates are 
that about 10% of people, despite appropriate medication, dosing appropriately, and um, is that about 10% of patients become resistant to treatment over time. And worse, not only may a patient not respond to the treatment given, but may be responding and lose that effect and then actually fail to recover in subsequent episodes. Now, we have a number of medications of different classes, and people tend to try different things. But once you reach the point of receiving and failing electroconvulsive therapy, they're really only experimental treatment options. And prior to 10 years ago, ablative neurosurgery was really not even evidence-based and proven, but was available in very, very limited um, centers. And it was really in the very, very early days of vagus nerve stimulation or ketamine, all of which were just in early experimental trials with the first publications fairly recently out. So if we actually look backwards and say, what was going on in 2001 to kind of even consider neuromodulation or brain stimulation in the brain with an implanted electrode as a potential strategy, why would that even be in our mindset? Well, there were several scientific facilitators, and namely, this was going on in neurology. There were tremendous advances in the stereotactic neurosurgery field with the ability to implant with tremendous anatomical precision. There was growing experience in Parkinson's disease and tremor. And most importantly, the previous 10 years had shown an explosion of information and findings of what is the potential wiring diagram or targets in the brain that might be um, treated um, for something like depression. So those three factors really um, facilitated our interest. So I think it's important to actually understand why are we not at the same point in time 10 years later that the movement disorder field is. And again, this is just a summary of really the prototype for brain stimulation in neurology, Parkinson's disease. You have a syndrome that's associated with tremor, rigidity, trouble with walking. Um, there are a number of cognitive and affective symptoms as well. It's a syndrome. It can be made pathologically at postmortem. There's loss and death of pigmented nuclei in the midbrain. It can be mapped with imaging and actually see the loss of the dopamine cells in the striatum. And that treatment and pathology, and the treatment was actually directly linked to understanding the pathology and the chemistry. And in the early 60s, Parkinson's was treated with L-DOPA to help in replacing the missing dopamine. But at the same time, research was going on to understand the context in which the chemical treatment worked. How is it that dopamine can affect motor control in the way that it does. And it was by defining circuits where dopamine worked. That led to actually understanding why did particular lesions in the brain alleviate symptoms such as tremor. And that led in a fairly systematic way in the late 80s to testing the use of high frequency brain stimulation as a substitute for actually a permanent brain lesion. And it was that clever linkage between the pathology, the chemistry, the circuits, and the lesions to put together a cogent story that led to the first studies of DBS for tremor, but later for its testing for certain but not all symptoms in Parkinson's. And again, this just really, if, if the audience has not seen this, the almost miraculous way in which brain stimulation applied very focally in the subthalamic nucleus can totally alleviate tremor, as you can see in this patient here. I will touch my finger. Okay. Can you touch, can you try to touch my finger? Let's try it a little better. Just turned it on. 
can see the dramatic change in tremor as the high frequency stimulation applied to a very, very specific place in the brain um, has occurred. This is now FDA approved, and it took over 10 years to get it approved, even just for simple tremor, close to 14 years to get it approved for Parkinson's disease. But now worldwide, more than 100,000 people have been implanted. And I just want to point out that despite this phenomenal success of this treatment, there's been no basic change in the technology over all of this time. What we use then is what we use now. So as we get to our, our main focus is, it was a very simple question. Can we treat depression, particularly in its most severe forms, like Parkinson's disease? And in order to address that question, we have four specific questions. We need to know if there's an illness circuit. We need to know what changes are necessary and sufficient. We need to know where we should stimulate. And we need to know which patients. So, what really led up to the first studies of brain stimulation for depression was a lot of preparation, because it was really about leveraging what was already known and looking for opportunities that might justify that kind of intervention. So what was going on back then? To define depression circuits, which we actually sort of take very much for granted now, as we do for all psychiatric disorders that we imagine that there are a set of nodes in the brain that are connected to one another, and that they are responsible for mediating a number of different behaviors. And in, part, and in depression, we have a primary problem with negative mood that affects cognition, our circadian rhythms and drives, and also affects movement and activity. And in the late 80s, one of the early theories about circuits that might mediate these effects actually came from the movement disorder um, world, that looking at connections between the frontal cortex, the basal ganglia, and the thalamus led to really thinking about segregated circuits that might actually impact motor, autonomic functioning, cognition, and mood. And so the approach was really to map symptoms to distinct pathways or regions and actually evaluate whether or not treatments would impact some or all of these circuits. Well, the strategies, we started to have a number of different approaches. Some of the earliest work was done by Bob Robinson at Hopkins with his colleagues in neurology at University of Maryland, where they actually mapped what brain lesions could lead to depression after stroke and found a very, very critical role of the frontal cortex. This was followed by work to look anatomically, both with MRI measurements and in postmortem brain, spearheaded first by Wayne Drevis and then replicated by others, to actually see that it wasn't just the prefrontal cortex, but there were actually abnormalities in the ventral medial frontal cortex and also in the ventral cingulate. Now, Similarly, work was looking at models of stress and the role of atrophy in the hippocampus that had been identified in animal models. And Evetulene identified that, yes, in fact, depressed people, particularly if they were chronically ill without treatment, had shrinkage of their hippocampi. And so we started to get different brain regions that showed structural abnormalities. And this was followed really in parallel with studies of brain function, whether it was brain glucose metabolism measured with PET scanning or brain blood flow measured with spec scanning, um, and later with functional MRI. This was well before MRI was used um, as a research tool in psychiatry. There started to be patterns of low activity involving the frontal lobes and the cingulate that started to suggest that there was a number of regions involved in patients when they were depressed. But what was also very clear is that despite very a number of common themes, there were actually contradictions. And as Dr. Drevitz pointed out, that not everyone was seeing the hypometabolism as had first been reported by Lou Baxter and his colleagues at UCLA, but actually the similar brain regions could actually be overactive in patients who at least 
on the surface seemed to be comparably depressed. So we started to have a contradiction. There were a number of different regions, but that not all patients showed the same pattern. And I think that what we were learning in those early days were early clues to the idea of what all the clinicians already know, that not all depressions have the same origins. And that's probably true at the level of the brain as well. So the next step became, if we have a number of brain abnormalities at either the functional or structural level, what regions change? Do all regions change? What happens when we treat? So we can start to collate the locations of brain areas that have abnormalities. We can start to assign by studies that evaluate the magnitude of clinical effects and start to get ideas about different brain regions being responsible for different aspects of the depression syndrome. But we can start to actually treat people with well-known evidence-based treatments at standard doses and literally look to see how does brain activity change as one goes from sick to well. And as we studied, we and others, medications like serotonin reuptake inhibitors, we started to see patterns where certain brain areas had their activity attenuated. And some of the first areas we saw were in the anterior insula and in a region called the subcolossal cingulate, or area 25. But at the same time, we saw normalization or correction of low activity in regions like the frontal cortex. Well, we could also study non-drug-based treatments to actually see if there was a final common pathway. And what we learned was that treatments such as CBT also had effects on the brain and very specific patterns, but they were different. They affected the brain system, but in different ways, and often in a contrary direction to what we saw with drugs. So we started to see that there were complementary, but not necessarily redundant or final common pathways in the brain where the brain was normalized or regulated with different treatments. And the issue became, if we're thinking back to our primary goal, where would you stick an electrode if you wanted to tune a circuit, that we're actually at an impasse at this point, because there's no one node, one compartment, or any one behavior that really is standing out. So we stepped back and actually thought a bit about, what is it in depression that's the most debilitating component? What do patients complain about? What really leads to the suffering? And I think it's by going to suffering itself and trying to understand what is that like? Where does that live in the brain? What generates it? And even historically, what's been very clear is that the psychic pain of depression is something that no one, unless you've suffered from depression, knows about. That it's a change in one's psychic energy to the point that patients describe a state of actually being nearly immobile, but incredibly uncomfortable. And as, and as writers have said for, for many generations, whether it be William James or William Styron, um, patients can be eloquent in their suffering to help us to understand what that's about. One of our patients described it as a gnawing agony a painful self-loathing that consumes all of your energy and attention. So one hypothesis is, if we can understand where negative mood lives, where the suffering lives, perhaps, in fact, all the other symptoms are derivatives of that. And so one of an early experiment was to try to map depression directly, map the negative mood directly by actually having <coughs> people recollect personal sad memories, and to see what in the brain changed. Excuse me. And what we found was incredibly important to the rest of this story, which was that of all available brain areas, the areas that activated as proportional to how sad a person felt was area 25. And simultaneously, patients' frontal lobes turned off. And so we have what in fact all of the writers have described, an emotion state that actually turns off one's ability to think. So we start to have constrained our many region map 
to some that seem to be very important but still have a limitation of where in the frontal lobe would one possibly go. It's a very, very large landscape. Area 25 is a little more manageable. But in fact, we want to have good evidence to proceed in that direction. And what became very clear is that Area 25 seemed to stand out. It could be provoked with a sad memory. When people get sad with a tryptophan depletion protocol, this is the area that tracks with the magnitude of negative mood. But more important for thinking about what do we want to change in the brain to help patients recover, that down-regulating activity in the subcolossal cingulate was seen with three different experiments and three different serotonin reuptake inhibitors is seen with successful response to ventlafaxine, a different class of antidepressant. It even downregulates in people who respond over six weeks to placebo. It's been associated with response to RTMS, to electroconvulsive shock, and to vagus nerve stimulation. And it's seen that despite many regions participating in each one of these treatments, a final common pathway, particularly as you got into medication or somatic treatment was that downregulation, however you managed it of Area 25, was critical to the story. Interestingly, this area really overlaps where Drevitz and Onger and Rojkowska have all identified volume losses and loss of glial cells. So something goes wrong in this area that can have widespread impact. And our hypothesis was in treatment resistance, perhaps we need to go directly to this source. Because if you can't talk it down, drug it down, or shock it down, maybe you can tune it directly. So if we go back to, this really gets us back to the beginning. We have a model. We have a target, really a very gross target um, in the subcolossal cingulate. But overlapping between the area that is associated with activation of negative mood, area that downregulates with successful antidepressants. It's really at a crossroads of a number of different connections in the brain to make up this sort of circuit. And we literally, with, with 1.5 Tesla imaging, targeted this using standard conventional neurosurgical approaches where patients are implanted awake, um, fitted with a frame that allows the surgeon to drive directly to the coordinates that they choose in advance, implant these two wires deep in the brain, connect them to cables that be, are connected to a small battery pack that can be placed under the clavicle, and allow one then to stimulate along each or any of the four contacts that are implanted in and around Area 25. So with this technology in mind, who actually, when one thinks about it, would be appropriate patients to consider um, such a novel, experimental, and invasive treatment? And in our mind, that this was really to be reserved for patients who really had failed all other options. As I've said before, patients who are disabled and are functionally disabled, who have been in their current episode a minimum of a year, who meet um, severity criteria on standard measures, who have good evidence by careful review of records that they've failed not only multiple medications, but psychotherapy and ECT, and that they actually don't have other problems. This was really an experiment about major depression. But I think that you know a list doesn't do justice to what it is that a patient wants, experiences, or the level of suffering. And I'm going to play a video of um, patient number five in Toronto um, um, prior um, to surgery and what his motivation and his description of his own state was. Um, I was pretty convinced that I was going to die, that um, there was nothing left for me. I had completely, my life had completely closed in. I had two friends. Um, I wasn't working. I couldn't work. Um, all I did was lay in bed for days. 
sometimes I see, sometimes I don't. I think for anyone in the audience who has major depression, knows someone who has major depression, these are very, very familiar symptoms. The difference is, is this man had been that way for the past four years and nothing could be done to alleviate it. So his expectation was low but hopeful. So I presented what um, we found in the first six patients and that prompted really expanding that first proof of principle testing to look at safety and efficacy of stimulating in the subcolosal cingulate white matter. And the six patients was expanded to 20 with those same criteria with the results published in 2008. And in the additional 14, those first six are added to this graph. You can see that over the course of the first month, there was a significant drop in the depression severity rating scales and that um, once better, there was a, a sustained response, not just at six months, but out to a year. With a 60% response rate in this group, that was sustained. Um, this paper was followed up with a long-term follow-up um, on 14 um, of the patients available, anywhere from three to six years. This was published um, in the American Journal of Psychiatry. The Kennedy, the psychiatrist, was the first author. And as you can see that whether it's a year, two years, three years, basically if you got better, you stayed better. And I think one of the most important findings in this first study was the lack of relapse in patients who had a functioning DBS unit. It's important to appreciate that this is on every day, all the time, delivering 130 hertz of current but that once the setting is set, we tend to not change it. It isn't like Parkinson's where there's progression of the disease and you need to keep making adjustments. Once it's set and you have the right setting and it's in the right place, um, there's sustained benefit. So this brings up, so now what are we doing? Because 2011 is three years ago. Once one has any kind of modicum of success, even in a open label experiment, the question is, is can we do better? And actually, what are we doing? I think it's an opportunity when one sees this kind of recovery and sustained recovery in people this ill is to try to understand it and not just work to make it work more widely available. So importantly is one would never want to implant someone who would not be appropriate. And if one's going to implant, how precise does one need to be and actually, can we capture those patients that we didn't get better? We equally want to try to understand what it is that we're doing. Are we just turning off negative mood, or are we actually enhancing positive mood? And I think this is a question that we're asking ourselves, whether we're studying vagus nerve stimulation, medication, particularly the new work on acute effects of ketamine. Are we affecting mood only, or are we affecting motivation some of the more drive and vegetated features, or even cognition itself. And as we're going to go over, there are other brain targets being investigated other than the Area 25 white matter target. Do they impact the same network? Do they impact the same symptoms? Do they have the same time course, side effects? These are all important opportunities to understand the depression circuitry and actually how to match patients to an optimal treatment. What we're also kind of seeing is that it may be that once the brain is working, that rehabilitation actually becomes important to enhance the DBS effects, perhaps to even facilitate plasticity. And that really gets at understanding some basic mechanisms. It's a perfect opportunity now that some nodes in a circuit are better identified to reverse engineer this work to animal models where the real nuts and bolts of the mechanisms of this can be done. But it's also opportunity to think about what are we doing to the patients in real time? And can we link up what's happening invasively to non-invasive um, treatments such as um, TMS or direct current stents? So I think it's important to kind of think what else is going on in the field. There have been three major publications, again, all on 
small numbers of subjects, but important proof of principle experiments. Um, the first, um, looking at the ventral capsule, ventral striatum target, um, done as a three-center trial and reporting a 40% response rate at six months. A second on stimulating nearby but directly in the nucleus accumbens. Again, an open-label study looking out a year. About half the patients got better, half didn't. And a third paper just out quite recently going into the medial forebrain bundle that has shown, although a, a smaller sample and a um, shorter period of follow-up, a dramatic effect that's quite rapid with um, a interesting um, response rate as well. So we have multiple regions that might be targeted. And I think the title really sums it up. Are all the treatments just going at different nodes in the same network? Are they actually impacting the same sets of symptoms? And who is the best patient for each one of these? Perhaps when only half the patients get well, despite how ill they are in any one study, perhaps one of the other targets might have been a good alternative. And how can we possibly know why? And I leave that as an open question we can discuss perhaps later. But I think we are so early in the days of DBS, we really need whoever is studying whatever target really needs to drill deep to really understand what they're doing to optimize what's going on in a particular intervention. Just like in Parkinson's, there, were, there was work looking at the subthalamic nucleus, work looking at the globus pallidus, and it was only once the safety and efficacy of each intervention was understood that they were compared in head-to-head -head trials. So what we proceeded to focus on at Emory was to actually see whether or not only major depressive patients would respond or whether or not patients who had other kinds of treatment-resistant depression might benefit from this. This is important because in bipolar disorder, one of the difficulties in treating with antidepressants can be that you can flip patients into mania. And in bipolar II, not only can they be notoriously difficult to treat, but hypomania can be a side effect of the treatments themselves. And we embarked on a one-month placebo lead-in um, experiment of patients with both unipolar depression and bipolar type II depression, very similar in terms of age, degrees of severity, we used very comparable criteria to what we had done in Toronto. And the first patient was implanted, um, well, it's an anniversary here, seven years ago. This work was um, funded by the Dana Foundation and the Stanley Foundation and the Woodruff Foundation, and we had help from the hospital at Emory as well. Um, what we found was that, similar to what we had seen in Toronto, that patients over the course of six months 42% of them got better. We didn't do quite as well as we had done initially in, in Toronto, but that we caught up and that by the end of two years that patients um, recovered and we had a 65% response rate. Our last follow-up on 12 of the 14 patients that are available is an 80% um, response rate. So once you get better, you stay better. We have had patients um, explanted and we have started some new studies. What was important, I think, in this paper that was um, published in the archives of general psychiatry was that we really didn't see a difference between the bipolar patients and the unipolar patients in terms of the trajectory of their response. We did not induce mania or hypomania. And overall, not only was the time course and the remission rate similar to Toronto, um, we saw this continued improvement over time, which was, was really quite interesting and something we don't quite understand. But most importantly, if you remitted, we have not seen spontaneous relapses. As long as the system is functioning, if a system malfunctions, if the battery dies, it breaks, we um, have seen patients um, relapse. This work has been replicated now in Spain. There was an industry-sponsored pilot published from three centers in Canada. There have been case reports from Argentina and Germany and in Canada. And so people are looking into this 
by more groups than um, the initial group in Canada and now at Emory. And so we're encouraged, but obviously um, randomized sham controlled trials are needed and are currently underway. So what are some of the really critical issues? And I alluded to it with the notion of what happens when a battery dies. But we'd like and didn't know initially if maybe once you're well, you could turn it off. Maybe the brain could take over because you had catalyzed normal plasticity. And in the original study um, of Dr. Holzheimer's, we actually did a blinded sham discontinuation at the end of six months in three patients. And we stopped at three patients because all of them had a rapid deterioration over about two weeks. It wasn't abrupt but it was a predictable and significant deterioration. We're still wondering whether or not the symptoms were as bad as they were at presentation, but didn't really want to wait around to find out. And we reinitiated stimulation and stopped that experiment. Um, but what we found was that the recovery, if we allowed patients to actually have a 35% change in their Hamilton score, actually had the similar trajectory than it had had originally. So whatever we're doing, we are not fixing the brain. We're at least not fixing it at six months. And we've confirmed this over and over again now, because every time a battery is depleted, patients get the dwindles. And so we're not seeing evidence of plasticity, at least corrective plasticity. But what we haven't done is to test to see whether or not patients could be rescued with more conventional treatments. You know, once you have an implant in, it's just easier to replace the battery and turn it back on, particularly when a patient has been doing very well. I think this issue of rate of deterioration may be different for different CBS brain targets. But I think that more fundamentally, the idea that patients take several weeks to regress may be able to turn it off temporarily, but do need to have it on. This is a new opportunity that we are looking at very seriously, which is how might we actually cycle the stimulation. Perhaps this can be a demand pacemaker that comes on and is set when you need it rather than on all the time. So an important issue now is what are the sources of variability? The obvious is surgical imprecision. The other obvious is who you select. One is very difficult because we don't know who the optimal patients are. And there is no clear clue yet as to how to pick a patient that will best respond to DBS. We know we can do well by many patients, but we don't know who shouldn't approach surgery, at least if they meet all of the other inclusion criteria. But we can do something about trying to understand where we implant. And in Toronto, we went to look at where we were stimulating. And even in standard space, we could make no differentiation between the location of where responders were implanted and the location of where non-responders were being implanted and stimulated. And as we got more experience and did more cases at Emory, we, again, we can be more precise where we implant, where we stimulate. We have much less variability. And we still can't distinguish who's getting better and who isn't at six months by where we are stimulating. So what are we missing? And we, again, go back. And this is why the science of, of these experiments is so critical. We actually had a clue in the very early days. We knew that responders not only had changes in Area 25 where I'm pointing, but actually had changes in blood flow remote from the area of stimulation. It wasn't just a local effect. It was a network effect. And what we also noticed, even though we had very few non-responders in those early days, was that if you didn't reach these outer areas, you didn't get well. That this wasn't just about stimulating area 25 and down-regulating it, which was not a problem. It was impacting the rest of the circuit. Well, we can go to our basic science colleagues who have mapped out these connections. And we can use 
new tools, and this is examples of white matter tractography done with diffusion MRI scanning. And one can start to look at what is the connection in these white matter pathways that I'm pointing to. What's the difference between stimulating one contact over another? And what we see is that a very, very minor change in anatomy can have a very major change in the pattern of connection. And we've learned that and tested this concept by recognizing that in a non-responder, we looked like we had a contact that was in the appropriate location. But as you can see from a map of her response change in symptoms, that it was pretty flat over the course of six months. She was trying very hard and was hopeful, but really was considered a non-responder at six months. And reevaluating what our options were, we realized we hadn't implanted deep enough. And we really had no other option for stimulation. And so we made the clinical decision, and the patient was certainly um, in favor, to reimplant and give ourselves additional options deeper in the brain. And with stimulation, this led to a sustained and progressive improvement in her depressive symptoms. At six months, she was a remitter, and at eight months, she had her first job. So this became a very, very important proof of principle to really understand what we had changed, because we had made a very, very minor difference, about a millimeter and a half, between where we were stimulating on contact one in, after the first operation and where we were stimulating on contact three at the second operation. But what we learned from the tractography map is that this was basically stimulated whole different networks in the brain, that we had similarities right around the stimulation contact, but that we actually hadn't reached what turns out to be a very critical area in the frontal cortex, in the medial frontal cortex. As one can see in white surgery one, we impacted the cingulate and subcortical areas in area 25, but only with surgery two did we reach out and actually impact activity in the medial frontal cortex. So this gave us a hypothesis that there was not just a local effect, but a combination of effects we needed to achieve recovery. And we then went to really study if that's true, then there should be a common track map, a common template of brain connections that we see in everyone who has gotten well at six months. And we can use both the location of the electrode and the amount of current that's being used for that particular individual and actually stack up and map what's in common between everyone if you're well and how is it different from the people who aren't well. And when one looks at the overlap, we see that we get a lot of these three circuits in all the patients. But if you fail to get to the medial frontal cortex, you are a non-responder. And is this new precision surgical planning that has really been a major thrust of the lab here, we now do prospective surgical planning to define in advance how do we get the combination of those critical circuits. This is a single patient. This is a track map that we do on their DTI diffusion scans before we go to the operating room. And we can actually plan in advance and drive around in the brain in the DTI scan to actually help Dr. Gross, the surgeon, implant precisely in the intersection of these tracks. So now what are some things that we can do to actually take advantage of the fact that why three connections? Why three pathways? Well, we know that there are different components, different behaviors that are affected. And it gives us an opportunity to go back to much of the work that we had done previously to try to understand both the local effect. We know a lot about medial 10 and its involvement in emotion regulation, in emotional self-relevance, and emotional bias. And we can also look at potential um, components of depression in terms of drive states or autonomic effects by actually mapping behaviors to individual regions and individual pathways. Because what we'd like is to have some biomarkers that might help us to know that we're in the right place and that might help us to um, match symptoms in a particular individual's 
to the targeting. So what's an example of such an experiment? Well, what we can now do is not just make people sad, but just listen to the cells in Area 25 and see what they respond to. And in a study that was published this last year from the Toronto group, if literally you record from cells in Area 25 as the patient awake in the operating room looks and just processes without actually doing anything in particular, different kinds of pictures, emotional pictures, far and away what Area 25 responds to is disturbing and sad pictures. It has some reactions to emotionally provocative pictures, but really far and away it's monitoring negative. And so a real next step that we hope to do in our next experiments is how does DBS actually change this? Is this just how Area 25 responds or is this actually negative bias? The other thing we want to consider is the effects of stimulation in the operating room because it turns out that while it takes a while to get totally well, one can actually measure in real time changes when one clicks into the exact precise spot in the operating room. And patients actually have a number of spontaneous self-reports. For a given patient, it's quite reproducible, but it actually is only when one's in that combination of three connections. And what we're doing now is actually in the operating room with a fairly elaborate and large team, many of the people I showed on that early slide of the team, with the patient awake, with the surgeon behind the surgical and sterile field, we can actually stimulate. Here's Dr. Riva Pose. I'm talking to the patient. Dr. Smart is actually measuring brain activity, local field potentials in real time while we monitor scalp activity, Area 25 activity, and autonomic activity so that we can get a true notion of how the brain changes as stimulation is applied second by second. So overall, the goal of all of this now that we have a target, have some reasonable success with getting people well and keeping them well, our real focus is to really try to understand more fundamentally who are the right patients. We're working on studies of pre-treatment or pre-enrollment mapping with PET scanning and with resting state fMRI because what we really want to do is know we have the right patient, they have the right brain state, we can identify in advance where to go, and that we can map what we do. This is generation one. We're not doing too badly. We can do better. But now with the Connectome project that everyone has read about, we're now starting to have access to maps of these white matter tracks in the type of precision and detail that we couldn't have dreamed about. And if we can really start to understand the precision and the crossings of these different connections. There's actually development of new electrodes that will allow us to actually steer. We don't just want to have a cloud of activity. We want to be able to stimulate at any one of these contacts or to direct traffic where some contacts are going superiorly up the cingulate, others are going forward into medial frontal cortex, and that we have precision which will help us to avoid side effects. We equally don't want to have to limit our experiments to the operating room, which is a lot of time, difficult on the patient, um, and not the best environment to really learn about the brain. But there are new devices that actually allow telemetry in real time of what's happening precisely where we're stimulating. So instead of just doing field potentials in the operating room, we're now about to embark on an experiment where we can measure what's happening in Area 25 in real time outside of the operating room and understand how activity there is changing over the course of recovery. So I just want to end with some thoughts back to the patient. The science is incredibly exciting. The imaging is exciting. The opportunities for new devices is exciting. The world is open, and this field has been very helpful. But I think it gives some pause to think about really what is depression and what is successful recovery? I think that overall, this is not a immediate or rapid acting antidepressant. There is some kind of initial switch that we can predict 
and evoke in the operating room and know we're in the right place. But then that transitions to a slower relearning and plasticity effect that we'll have to learn what it really is. Some patients get better very, very rapidly. Other patients take a much longer time. And part of it may be due to targeting, but we don't have any obvious other clinical predictors yet. And that is going to be something that will require many more patients. We have a burden of wellness that we start to see. You know, when patients have been chronically ill, all you want is to have the pain go away. And once you no longer have pain, you actually have to remodel old habits and change an entire lifestyle to go with what you do when you don't have to worry about when you next relapse. And that really is not a brain stimulation approach. That really is a therapy and rehab approach. And this is really requiring new models of rehabilitation. I think that this cartoon really sums it up, that when you've been ill, you want to feel better, but you equally imagine a new life. And I think we really have to come to grips with we want to return patients to their own neutral and then put their brain in the position to help them go in any direction that they choose. So to just end, recovery really takes more than a stimulator. There's an early reset, there's plasticity, and there's clearly learning over time. The patients are very, very clear. They're much better at a year or two years. They start to really describe a resilience, the ability to do more things. And what is our capacity when we aren't constantly falling in a, um, in a hole? Um, one can actually build on a platform um, of success by having more success. Our patients are very clear that DBS doesn't push positive, it enables positive but all of them come to realize this, that they really didn't realize how much work they would need to do themselves. I'm going to just end by playing um, the tapes on two patients so you can actually hear how they have found the experience, but actually recognizing that our goal is to optimize surgery, figure out the parameters and rehabilitation strategies that best match what we're doing, considering that we're watching the biology change over time. So let's listen to these two patients, and then I'll end. He gave me the bridge. He gave me the energy. He gave me the release of the impression. You know, just the amazing ability. It sort of took away the, the um, pulling of the depression, the, the emptiness, the despair. And just to end, because I think I can't emphasize enough, the multidisciplinary way in which patients must be taken care of. Their medications may need to be tweaked. We can't get everyone off of medication. But that therapy is an absolute essential, as this patient described. Coming to therapy, it did help. I did get something out of it. But after the surgery, when I took this 15-week course, it was like night and day. The things that I learned in hospital therapy, I understood. I understood what they were talking about. They made sense what they were talking about. But I could feel. I could feel um, when something makes sense. It makes sense up here, but it makes sense in, in my soul, in my being. Night and day, what uh, what I got out of cognitive therapy before surgery, and what I got out of it because I had to bring the work. So I'll stop there. Helen, I, what extraordinary work and what a, a wonderful presentation um, on your work, and you presented it in a way that is understandable not only to scientists but to to lay people. Um, we have lots of questions. Um, unfortunately. We, we are literally out of time right now, so I'm not going to be able to ask the question other than request that at some point in the not too distant future we have a chance to have you back to present more information, in particular to speak about some of the um, uh, some of the biomarkers that you've been working on and that has received tremendous attention in terms of treatment selection. Um, but it's now uh, three o'clock. I'm going to need to say. Thank you to you, and thank you to 
our audience for joining us. Um, the foundation through its research grants is dedicated to improving the lives of people with a wide variety of psychiatric conditions. And um, all the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a gift, please visit us at our website, bbrfoundation.org, or call 1-800-829-8289. This has been recorded so people can see portions of it again. And certainly, please encourage friends, um, colleagues to um, watch the recording. Our next webinar will be on February 11th at 2 p.m when Dr. William Carpenter, um, who's uh, a member of our scientific council, will speak about new approaches for therapeutic discovery in schizophrenia. Um, I want to again say thank you to our audience, and in particular, say thank you to you, Helen, for your work and for taking the time to share it with us. My pleasure, and I'm sorry for going over and not leaving time for questions. We'll do it in the future, but I, you, I wouldn't have cut a word out from what you said. So thank you so very, very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.